Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning at Wesley. My name is Pastor Sylvia Harris, and I'm so glad to see all of you who have joined us this morning for this fourth Sunday in Lent. We are getting closer and closer to the cross, and I pray that each of you is growing closer to the Lord. I have a few announcements for you this morning. The first one is that we are looking for palms to decorate the altar with on Palm Sunday. So if you happen to have one of those amazing trees in your own yard or access to palm branches, let us know. We would be glad to take those donations. Um, palm Sunday will be the last Sunday of this month, so March the 28th. Also, I want to let you know that we are planning to have a Good Friday worship service. Good Friday this year is on Friday, April the 2nd, and that service for in-person will be at 12 o'clock noon on that Friday, and all are welcome to join us for that service. And we will also post that online afterwards, just like we do for our Sunday services for those of you who don't come in person. I would also like to let you know that we are always looking for volunteers for Sunday morning, so if you would like to help with ushering or with reading the liturgy or any other portion of the service, please let us know, and we would be glad to have you be a part of the worship service. So please just keep that in mind as we are starting to come back in person. And my final announcement this morning is that March is National Women's History Month, and so we're going to be recognizing different women from the U.S. and around the world over the next several Sundays. For those of you who don't know, International Women's Day was this past week on Monday, March the 8th. This day is a day that recognizes the extraordinary acts of courage and determination by ordinary women from around the world. In 1908, National Women's Day was established in honor of the garments, garment workers' strike in New York. Afterward, women in the United States and Europe held rallies to express solidarity with other activists, including the Russian women's peace movement during World War I. International Women's Day was first celebrated by the United Nations in 1975 and has continued its global connections. As Christians, we recognize that all people are created in the Imago Dei, or in the image of God, regardless of their gender. So over the next few weeks, we will be lifting up specific women who are shining like beacons on the hill, lights for the world to see their strength. The reality of life for girls and women in the world is often bleak. We have little option of living a life beyond what is allowable by the men and patriarchal cultures and structures where they find themselves. In the United States, women still struggle to be treated equally to their male counterparts. In 2020, women were still being paid only 82 cents on the dollar to what a man earns, and women only have 70% of what men have at the time of retirement for income. These disparities vary then even more when factoring in considerations such as race, ethnicity, disability, access to education, and age. There are jobs which are still predominantly male or female oriented. Just this past week, my children asked me why nearly all of the teachers in their elementary school are women. They identified only one male grade specific teacher in their entire school. Meanwhile, the two principals that have been at that school since they have been there were, of course, both male. There are glass ceilings and underlying prejudices regarding the gifts and graces and abilities of women that we continue to wrestle with, even in our postmodern world. We need to acknowledge these challenges while highlighting women and girls who shatter glass ceilings, who break into areas that have long been dominated by men. Excuse me. We know that there has been a very recent shattering of the major glass ceiling in the United States. And obviously it affects me. I want to highlight this morning. I apologize. I was not expecting this. I want to highlight this morning our Vice President. As a mother of girls, 
chills, it touches me to know that they have witnessed the election of our first female vice president. Um, Kamala D. Harris was born on October 20th of 1964 to parents who were immigrated, excuse me, who immigrated from India and from the British Jamaican Islands. She graduated from Howard University with a degree in political science and economics before going on to graduate from the University of California, Hastings College of Law, and joining the California Bar in 1990. She had a long career in California as a prosecutor at various levels, including serving as the district attorney for San Francisco from 2004 to 2011, and then also serving as the attorney general for the entire state of California from 2011 to 2017. She was then elected to the Senate, where she served from 2017 until just earlier this year, when she was sworn in as the first female vice president in the United States. Say what you will about her political leanings. No one can deny that she shattered a glass ceiling. Time and time again, she stands as a woman who has been driven and determined. She was the first woman and the first African-American to serve as the Attorney General for the state of California. She's the first Asian-American and the second African-American woman to serve in the United States Senate. And of course, we all know that on January 20th, when she was sworn in as the 49th Vice President of the United States of America, she is serving once again as the first African-American, the first Asian-American, and the first woman in that role. It only took 100 years of women having the right to vote in the United States for a woman to be able to reach the second highest political position in our country. It's ironic in many ways that as a country that prides itself on being globally a leader, 57 other countries achieved electing a female to their highest political office before we did. In the United States, we have a lot to learn about treating people equally, regardless of their gender. In honor of Women's History Month, I recognize Kamala De Debbie Harris. She broke through to a level of leadership that has never been experienced by a woman in the United States. And she stands as a light for all women and girls as we continue the hard work of full equality as the social reality continues to oppress women and girls around the globe. Thank you for your patience with me on that one. Now I would like to invite my amazingly liberated and supportive husband. <laughs> I love you guys. Could you please join me in the lecture for this morning's call to worship? Absolutely. Thank you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Cry out to the Lord in your trouble. He will save you from your distress. Give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love. We give thanks to the Lord for his wondrous love endures forever. Today's opening prayer. God of boundless grace, you meet us where we are in the pits of despair or on the mountain of joy. You sent your Son that we may be rescued from sin and death. You sent your Spirit that we may be guided in your ways. Save us today, sanctifying us in all things. Amen. Amen.
morning's scripture lesson is from the Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 17. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people of Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more, and evildoers shall afflict them no more. As formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all of your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled, and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will punish him with a rod such as mortals use, with blows inflicted by human beings. But I will not take my steadfast love from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Word of God for the people of God and all God's children said, Thanks be to God. God. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? God of the shepherd David, we come before you this day asking for the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of the hearts and minds hearing my voice be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you alone for our rock, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Amen. So this morning's scripture lesson gives us what is known as the covenant of David. It tells us of the promises given to this once great king of Israel. The prophecy of promise that the Lord will not take away his love from the house of David. He would not do to David what he had done to his predecessor, King Saul. And this promise was, of course, initially seen in his son, King Solomon, who continued to unite Israel under one king. This promise of the house of David is also part of what marks the split eventually between the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel. It is part of how we read the prophetic texts in, this, in the Bible, all of those prophets, and how we understand and interpret them from a scholarly perspective. 
I must confess, there's a part of me, the Bible and history geek in me, that wants nothing more than to explain all of how this promise played out. But I would probably end up putting you to sleep if I went that way with my sermon this morning. Suffice it to say that this particular covenant plays a big role in understanding the prophetic message of a Messiah to come in the line of David. It's why Israel thought that the promise would come through a warrior king, somebody like David, who was going to overthrow oppressive empires seeking to do them harm. In the narrative of history, at the time that this promise was made, King David has secured Israel from what had been a perpetual threat of the Philistines. He has secured the return of the Ark of the Covenant, the place where God was known to reside. The Philistines had been a problem for Israel since the time of the judges, and so many generations had struggled to ever see themselves free of that conflict. And so now the once shepherd and the once harp player has now become the great warrior king that has united all of Israel and wants to have a house built where God can reside. David doesn't think it's right for Yahweh to continue leaning, living in a tent while as the king he resides in a house of cedar. A house of cedar showed great wealth for the king, while God, the Lord, was dwelling in a tent. And something about that just was not up to the standards that David sought. At the time, it was common practice in the Near East to build temples as a sign of strength, as a sign of permanence for a culture and a community. David was, in essence, wanting to show himself and to the people around him that were a threat to Israel that his rule had achieved the status of empire, that Israel was here to stay, that under the rule of King David, they were not going to go back to the chaos and the struggling way of living that had marked previous generations. So this desire to build a temple for the Lord had all of the hallmarks of a good idea. And Nathan, who was the royal prophet at the time, Nathan gives an immediate consent to the idea. He didn't even think about it. Maybe he thought that just on the surface this was a good idea. So yes, David, go and do all that you are talking about. I think, I think Nathan reacted like many of us do. It's a very human way to react. When we come through times of struggle and hardship, we want something that's going to mark life as normal again. When we come through challenging times, we look for a way to mark the shift away from the painful, difficult uncertainties. I think about something like the monuments that were erected around the country in remembrance of September 11th. There's the Flight 93 National Park that is in Pennsylvania. There's also the National September 11th Memorial and Museum in New York. Even in Phoenix, Arizona, where we are nowhere close to where the actual horrific events of that day took place, even here in Phoenix, there is a 9-11 memorial. Human nature, to some extent, human nature drives us to mark events as a way to remember the pain and recognize how we have grown since the struggle or horror potentially ended. Around the country, even around the world, there are different memorials and statues erected in the memory or recognition of different events or people. Of course, more recent years in our country, there has been the marked removal of statues and memorials that were erected to individuals who, in essence, represent oppressive, harmful, and hate-filled ideologies. Sometimes the collective response to traumatic, painful events is better marked by eradicating reminders such as those. Instead, the efforts that have been made to open museums and to hear the voices of the oppressed are actually the way that we heal at times, the way that we 
heal from the collective psychological impacts and emotional harm that has occurred. Memorializing things are a way to give us in our humanity a way to express pain, a way to hear a voice calling from the past and directing us towards our future. We need to always remember that the struggles, the painful, challenging times, and how we continue to fight to ensure human dignity and fullness of life moving forward. I think that this is why we create statues and museums, that on some subconscious level, we know that memorializing painful and harmful events help us to live more fully in the present. I look around us today and I think about the past year, the struggles with COVID and the number of lives lost. As of yesterday, March the 13th, we've lost over 532,000 individuals in the United States. If we compare that to the number of people who died on September 11th, 2,977, we had a month's time earlier this year where we were losing daily more people to COVID than we lost on that terrorist attack of a single day. Collectively, at this point in a year's time, we have lost more Americans to COVID than who died in the entirety of World War II from the United States. And not comparing those death totals in an attempt to compare the manner in which people have died. There's a distinct difference between death and war and death in a pandemic. I compare those numbers because I'm thinking about the ways that we memorialize tragedies and challenging times. We have memorials and museums dedicated to World War II and the lives lost during that time. I have no doubt that we will have COVID-19 memorials by the time we reach an end, or at least by the time we reach a mediating strategy to address all of what COVID has done to change our world. Maybe right now you're not thinking about a memorial at all when you think about light on the other side of COVID. Just because King David was thinking about how he could memorialize the accomplish accomplishments of his kingdom as he came out of that tumultuous time does not mean that that's exactly how we all individually think about the time of upheaval. Maybe we're questioning what's next in our daily lives. Many people have lost family members so daily life is definitely not like it was before. Many people have lost jobs, or at least seen a dramatic change in the way that they do their work. I often wonder, are restaurants ever going to return to normal? What about people in office jobs who now telecommute? Will that be their new normal? What about people who moved somewhere different because they could, they were telecommuting and didn't need to be in that location anymore? Are they now gonna have to move back closer to their employer? Now that an end is in sight, are there people that are going to have other struggles because their niche job is going to suddenly no longer be a niche that is needed? What about people who have lost their homes or people who are struggling to afford food? What's that going to do for resources and communities, like food banks and assistance programs? So much about daily life today is nothing like what daily life was one year ago. What about our church? What about Wesley? What are the changes that we're going to have to keep in place as a church? I know for the foreseeable future, we've got masks and we've got no singing. What about when it's deemed safe by medical experts? Are you going to stop wearing a mask? I like it, honesty. <laughs> <laughs> what about ministries? What are the ministries that we need at Wesley? As a faith community, there were activities and there were missional works and there were different things of outreach that we did before COVID. Are those still what we wanna do as we open our doors more and more post COVID? 
Or are we just going to go back to doing everything the way that we did before, doing church the way that we did before this virus shook up the entire world? Before you answer any of these questions I'm saying of what life looks like post-COVID, are you going to assume that you know the good answer to these questions before you ask the Lord to weigh in? Because that's exactly what Nathan and David did today. There was an idea. It seemed like a good idea because it was on the surface about the Lord and the benefit to the Lord to build this house. But this good idea that they had was not an idea born of God's will. Thankfully, in today's passage, we get to read here about how Nathan went about making things right. Of course, he did that only because the Lord came to him and said, no, what you said was wrong. You know, he comes to him that night and says, wherever I have moved about among the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Essentially, God is saying this idea of building something for me did not come from me. God says he doesn't need a house. He doesn't need a temple. That's where people try to confine the presence of the Holy One. The God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of exile, travels everywhere in creation. The idea of building a house was not an idea that was born of prayerful discernment. It was an idea that was born of a knee-jerk reaction to life circumstances and what seemed like the next best action. Nathan got a pretty good lesson directly from the Lord on what it means to be a prophet. Being a prophet means listening to the message of the living God rather than listening to the powers of the world. I think it's perhaps that Nathan learns this lesson so well because he's going to need to eventually push back very strongly on that power system. Later in David's life, I think we all know about his evil actions with his assault on Bathsheba and his treatment of her husband Uriah. And it was Nathan, the prophet, who could have been still a yes man at that time, but because he learned to not have that sort of immediate reaction, he pushed back and he challenged the king. Nathan, Nathan learned that if he needed to, to be where truth was, truth always rests in the Almighty. Truth is not in the might and the strength of the world. For Nathan to keep going and to keep the spirit of the Lord at the center of his life, he needed to listen to and honor the words of God rather than the words of man. And that's the same good news that we have in our lives today. We live in this amazing time, my friends. We live in this time when the spirit of truth the Holy Spirit of God is pouring out into the world. It used to be that before Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was only available to specific people at specific times and places. Like in today's scripture, God would only speak at very limited times and spaces like he did to the prophet Nathan. Today, though, we have access to God's voice in any place. And at any time. So instead of jumping to building memorials, instead of jumping into constructing new ways of being as we transition out of this time of COVID, instead of just looking and saying, that's a good idea, we have the blessing of being able to hear God's voice if we just stop to pray and listen. We have direct access to the presence of God in our lives. We have direct access that allows us 
to ask for guidance rather than taking a wrong step or declaring a wrong action. We have the ability for God to step in and step alongside of us because we have the privilege of God at all times being with us. In his letter to the Romans, Paul writes, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Even if you don't know what to pray, my friends, if you don't have the words to express what it is you need to tell God, what it is you might want to ask the Lord, the Holy Spirit hears your words and your cries clearly. The Holy Spirit intercedes and acts as a go-between, carrying your prayers because that is the will of the Lord. God wants to hear your prayers, even if it's groans, even if all you can pray is a sigh. You can't hold them in. You gotta groan, you gotta sigh, because that's how you pray sometimes. But when you do, God will hear you. God wants to hear you. And God wants you to listen for that response. Don't be like Nathan or David, assuming a good idea is the same as a God idea. Good ideas are not God ideas. Take your ideas to God in prayer. Take your thoughts on life, on the church, on Wesley, post-COVID, all of it. Take it to the Lord. Ask for clarity, for understanding, for guidance. Don't go making plans, even good plans, without first consulting the Lord. And then, act accordingly. Pray for what you need as an individual, my friends. Pray for what we need as a family at Wesley. Pray for what this country, for what this world needs, and for what you may do in that space. In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your thoughts, your ideas, your concerns, your hopes and dreams, let them all be made known to the Lord, for he will surely answer you and guide your next steps. That is good news indeed. Amen. Would you please join me in a prayer? God of saving grace, we come before you today as a people facing change once more. We faced change a year ago as this virus descended, creating chaos and upheaval and so much unknown. We are weary, weary of waiting for life to resume, weary of the uncertainty of next steps weary in being apart from those we love. We know that there is relief on the horizon, and yet it seems the challenges of separation carry on without end. Comfort, oh comfort our God. Comfort our God, we cry out. We cry out for you to comfort our broken weary hearts. Heal us, we pray. Heal us as a broken and disheartened people, renewing in us your strength, 
that we may continue to move forward even as we do not know what the future will hold. We confess that we once thought we knew the future. Before this virus, we could see plainly how our days would go. We knew how the world was ordered, and in our arrogance, we relied on our own ways, failing to realize the only truth is trusting in you always. Even now, Lord, as we cry out for your ways and your truth to be made known, we confess that we are clinging to our old ways of being, our old ways of knowing, our old ways of believing in this world. Help us, we pray, to see more clearly and to hear more fully your plans and ways for our lives, for our church, for our community, and for our world, that we may rest in the assurances that none of these things in this world are truly ours. Instead, we know all things we have, all things we are, reflect the glory and majesty of your grace, your love, your generous giving. Remind us that we are but stewards in this world, stewards of creation, of talents, of wealth, and yet we seem to cling unfairly to owning all that is yours. Loosen our hold on the material things of this world, helping us to return a portion of our gifts back to your care as a sign of our faith, as a sign of our gratitude for all you have poured out. Help us to return a portion of our gifts back as a sign of our trust in your never-ending goodness. Lord, as we journey closer to the cross, closer to the brutality of humanity, may we also journey ever closer to your presence, shedding those things which keep us closed off from your love, closed off from the fullness of life that you want us to live. Father, there are silent prayers, prayers burning in our hearts, Prayers we can only offer as groans and sighs too deep for words. Silently, we lift those prayers by your spirit now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our cries and hear our prayers. As we pray together now the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever. Amen.
everybody can sing. <laughs> I know I'm not the only one singing to myself. <laughs> At least I hope I'm not. <laughs> Praise the Lord indeed. And come to the Father through Jesus, his Son. And give him the glory. Great things he has done. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Take your life to the Lord in prayer. And ask for guidance. It's there. And then instead of just having a good idea, you'll have a God idea of what's next. As you go this week, know that wherever you go, and in all things, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, go with you always. Amen. Amen.